Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, we are so pleased with the high level of interest in this topic. Um, as Elos had posted earlier in the chat, it looks like over or 406 people have registered for the webinar today. So clearly it's a topic that's of interest to many people. Um, so the webinar today was organized through the ACRL IS Management and Leadership Committee. And I am Nicole Pagowski, Associate Librarian and Instruction Coordinator at the University of Arizona Libraries. And I will be co-moderating today with our chair, Matt Upson, Associate Professor and Director of Undergraduate Instruction and Outreach at Oklahoma State University. So we will be monitoring the chat um, to see if you have any questions for the speakers that we will address at the end of the session, um, not between their 10 minute um, presentations. Um, so we will get to them at the end. Um, and Matt will be collecting them and I believe I will be uh, reading them to the panelists um, for the last uh, 15 to 20 minutes today. Um, you're also welcome to tweet. The hashtag is ACRL instruction. Um, we probably won't be able to monitor Twitter as much, so don't post your questions there. If you'd like the panelists to, the panelists to address them, put them in the chat, please. But if you do want to tweet, that's an option. So a bit about our committee. Um, the ACRL instruction section management and leadership committee promotes effective leadership and management of academic library instruction programs through programs and initiatives. The committee designs and implements programming that supports librarians leading and setting strategic directions for their local instruction and information literacy programs. Addressing the unique needs of managers and coordinators, the committee facilitates discussions about issues such as leading on campus, developing staff, and planning for the future. And we have some events coming up, um, and Matt will be sharing the links in chat. So in addition to this discussion, the committee will also host sessions on ADA compliance and remediation on April 24th at 1 p.m. Central and the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning on May 1st at 11 Central. We also hosted a webinar in February on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the academic library instruction program. We are sharing the links for upcoming session registration and the recording for previous sessions. We'll also share the link to the committee website so you can download the slides later this week. Um, and as Elois had said before, there will be a recording. Um, a reminder of the session description, attendees will gain perspective on critical assessment practices in libraries from three academic librarians currently working with and exploring approaches that incorporate and are rooted in ethical orientations, inclusivity practices, and have impact on student learning as the guiding goal. Critical assessment practices engage critical perspectives and theories to interrogate the structures of power and methodologies that both motivate and facilitate assessment work in academic libraries. This hour-long panel will offer short 10-minute reflections from panelists, followed by 20 minutes of Q&A and discussion. And I am thrilled to introduce our panelists. We have Nicole Branch. She is an associate university librarian for learning and engagement at Santa Clara University in Santa Clara, California. In her time at Santa Clara, Nicole has also served as the Head of Instruction and Assessment, as well as Assessment Coordinator and Instruction Librarian. Prior to Santa Clara University, Nicole served as Librarian for Research and Digitization at Holy Names University in Oakland, California. Nicole's research interests include critical information literacy and assessment drawing on transformative methodologies. Zoe Fisher is an Instructional Designer at Pierce College in Lakewood, Washington. From 2012 to 2016, she was a tenured faculty librarian at Pierce, specializing in teaching information literacy, reading, and college success. Zoe's interests include pedagogy, student learning assessment, and privacy and ethics in education. You can find her online at quickaskzoe.com. And Ebony Magnus is the interim library manager at the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology in Calgary, Canada. Prior to her current role, she worked as an assessment and user experience librarian, studying the needs of library users and supporting strategic decision making through conscientious stewardship and critical evalu evaluation of library data. So thank you all again for attending and I will let our speakers take the mic. Thank you so much. I want to say thank you all for joining us today. Um, thank you to Lois, Matt and Nicole for organizing and facilitating. My name is Zoe Fisher. I'm your first presenter today for this webinar about critical assessment practices, a discussion on when and how to use student learning data without doing harm. Uh, we're gonna jump right in taking a look at our outcomes for today. Our hope is by the end of the session that you as attendees will have an opportunity to consider critical approaches to library assessment practices 
examine trends and implications of libraries using student data through various modalities, and that you'll explore practical approaches and methodologies for implementing critical assessment of student learning. Uh, to get there, we're going to break this up into three parts. I'm going to talk about the current context for library assessment work, emerging trends, and the distinctions between student learning assessment and student surveillance. Next, Ebony will speak about uh, using a critical assessment frame to consider questions of motivation, accountability, and agency in relation to collection of student data. And Nicole will share her experiences using transformative mixed methods to model developing student learning outcomes for the ACRL framework for information literacy. So I'll start with a question that was on my mind when I was thinking about preparing for the opportunity to speak with you today. And that's just a really big picture here of what kinds of student learning data do we tend to collect in the library and why. And you might have your own um, sort of set of thinking about this, but the way that I put it in my mind is sort of this way, that we collect data in order to provide services, for example, collecting identifying information in order to establish borrowing privileges. And when we also measure existing library services, spaces, and collections, or anticipate needs for new services, spaces, and collections. And in order to do that, we have to have data. Of course, we also collect data in order to be accountable um, and meet reporting requirements for both internal and external stakeholders, for example, accreditation. Thinking about that context, what are some of the trends in library use of student learning data? And we could go back decades and decades and decades thinking about these trends. Um, but I'm really most interested in the last 10 years. Um, and that's about as much time as I have this morning anyway. So I think these are some of the notable uh, sort of events in the last 10 years, notable publications. Um, in 2010, ACRL published the Value of Academic Libraries report, which was written by Megan Oakleaf, who's an LAS professor at Syracuse University. And this document, I think really for the first time, laid out what it was recommended for librarians to do in higher education in terms of how they should be assessing the work of their libraries. And there's a lot of emphasis in this report on writing outcomes, um, collecting student data, especially use of the library data, um, and integrating the library with other efforts on your campus to assess student learning and assess outcomes. I think the VAL report is also personally interesting to me because I graduated from my LIS program in 2010. And so I feel like my entire career as an academic librarian has kind of been in the shadow of the recommendations that were put forward in this report. Uh, from 2013 to 2016, we had the Assessment and Action Cohorts, which were led by ACRL through an IMLS-funded grant. And if you um, are curious, you can look at the individual reports for all 300-plus institutions that participated in Assessment and Action. But essentially, I think that AIA invited individual institutions to try to implement some of the suggestions in the VAL report. And I think probably the greatest benefit to those institutions that participated was that they had the opportunity to learn more about students and how they use the library um, and to work with campus partners and campus stakeholders to answer those questions in a systematic way. Um, most recently, uh, about two years ago in 2017, we have the Academic Library Impact Report, which I'll talk about more in a moment. Um, but if you haven't read these documents, I think they're worth looking at. So you have VAL in 2010, and then each year AIA put out a summary um, sort of highlighting the different studies that were done in those cohorts. And the piece that I find interesting is uh, this one. Um, it's from the last executive summary in 2017. And there's sort of this bold statement that's made at the front of this executive summary highlighting the studies in AIA that show a relationship between academic success and student use of the library. And so the summary that I have on the screen here says that uh, there's an analysis of multiple data points, for example, circulation, library instruction session attendance, online database access, study room use, and interlibrary loan, shows that students who use the library in some way achieved higher levels of academic success, for example, GPA, course grades, and retention, than students who did not use the library. Um, now, there are other sort of core findings in these AIA documents, but this is the one that I think is really guiding a lot of the work that we see in libraries across the country, where li libraries are trying to show their value, they're trying to show that libraries matter, um, and they're honing in on individual use of the library and the impact that that has um, on students or the correlation that it has with student success. 
In 2017, um, there's this report from ACRL, Academic Library Impact, Improving Practice and Essential Areas to Research. And it's kind of giving recommendations for the future. You know, now that AI is over, it's been, you know, several years since the VAL report, what is the direction of the value of academic libraries work? What kinds of research should librarians be doing? Um, and there's a section on page five of this document that frankly I find shocking and I'm surprised that it's not more controversial that ACRL is putting forward um, these suggested actions for librarians. So this is a, a section from page five which lays out several bullet points um, advocating for libraries to collect data, specifically, uh, you know, learning analytics kind of data that can be um, used in other systems across campus. And so some of the pieces that really stick out to me um, are the suggestion that libraries should collect data that can be integrated into learning analytics software, um, that library data should be included in multiple systems within the academic institution, um, and that library data should be used to predict student learning and success based on shared analytics. Um, and I think these recommendations have a huge impact on the conversations that we see happening professionally about assessment and about what we should be doing with student learning data. So for example, um, library assessment conference was in Houston just about four months ago at the end of 2018. There were 18 different sessions of shared papers at that um, conference. There was one session about teaching and learning because library assessment conference covers a lot of different topics, including services and spaces and things. But I thought it was notable of the you know five papers, uh, five presentations in the session, um, two of them were about learning analytics and, and libraries. And I think that's really a direct response to the trends we've seen uh, moving forward from the VAL report through IAA, uh, AIA through um, the Academic Library Impact document. And this is the question I find myself sitting with looking at about you know, 10 years of these trends. And it's this, are we interested in measuring what students do or what they learn? And I think the word surveillance is appropriate here. When we look at student behavior in library assessment, taking data like easy proxy logins, ID card swipes, article downloads, circulation records, tracking the amount of time that students spend in different spaces, both physical and online, and then connecting those individual actions with individual student performance and achievement. Um, we're not really monitoring learning, I think. We're monitoring um, behavior and what students do. And we see this uh, throughout uh, literature, different articles, but also um, the AIA studies. So in 2013, the University of Minnesota, we have a study that looked at library use at 13 different access points, and it correlated it with students' uh, retention and GPA. Uh, you've got another study that correlated easy proxy logins and circulation of physical materials with student retention. Um, and then a couple of the participants in AIA did things like correlating use of online library resources with GPA or correlating attendance and information literacy one shots with final course grades and retention. Um, so all of these examples are taking individual student behavior, student actions and correlating it with student academic achievement. In contrast, I think student learning assessment of information literacy really looks like some of these things. So writing and measuring student learning outcomes, collecting and reviewing samples of student work, reflective discussions among teachers about their pedagogy, revising assignments to improve student learning outcomes, and even revising those outcomes to improve student learning. This kind of work might not get published or fed into a dashboard, um, but it matters and it has a huge impact to your students, um, especially, most importantly, I think those discussions that teaching teams can have about what they see in student work, um, what they value, what they're hoping to see. Um, I think those discussions can be transformational and can yield really interesting new conversations, new directions for teaching and learning with students. If I could wave a magic wand and get what I wanted, um, I would really love to see more academic library assessment that's qualitative, ethnographic, longitudinal, rooted in conversations about pedagogy, power, and barriers and obstacles to learning faced by students, and respectful of students and their experiences, honoring their voices and expertise. So as I kind of wrap up with the time that I have 
with you today. I wanted to highlight some of the research and writing that I'm inspired by that I think is worth your time. Um, and I can't go through each of these um, that you see on the screen, but I'll say that um, I really love the 2016 study about how students get help with research assignments. The researchers actually had students draw pictures, like draw a map of their research process from start to finish. Um, and then they interviewed some of those students and asked them about their help seeking behaviors. Um, I love phenomenography as a methodology. So the Boone, Johnston, and Weber study where they asked English faculty to talk about what they thought information literacy is, is, is fascinating. Um, and of course that builds on Christine Bruce's work from the 90s um, about the phenomenon of information literacy. Uh, most recently, a publication I'm really excited about is the uh, Academic Libraries for Commuter Students book, um, which was edited by Regalado and Small. Um, their work, I think, has a lot of implications for higher education today due to the high number of commuter students that we have, um, thinking about their lives, the challenges they face, and how libraries can adapt to serve them better. Um, I think that's a fantastic publication. I'm excited about it. Um, and of course, the Ariel Project, I think, is a great example of like a longitudinal ethnographic study of students in higher education and how they actually get research done. Um, so with that, I'm going to pause there and hand things over to Ebony, who's going to take us um, a little bit different direction now that I've kind of laid out the foundation of the practical day to day, what's happening with student learning um, assessment and student learning data in the library. And Ebony is going to talk uh, a little bit more about some of the motivations and the philosophy and theory behind it. Thanks, Zoe. And thanks, everyone, for attending today. Um, just going to see if control goes over to me. So a critical assessment framework incorporates mindful practice in which power and positionality are at minimum laid bare if not actively questioned, and the agency and authority of participants is respected and held paramount. This means accepting that assessment is not neutral, nor are mechanisms of data creation and collection. The exploration that I've been doing on this topic with Maggie Faber and Jackie Bellinger draws, draws largely from other areas in higher education research, namely student affairs and institutional research in which some critical practitioners and researchers have set out to expose and address power, privilege, and structures, and make explicit the assumptions and intentions underlying assessment choices. For Wall, Hirsch, and Rogers, increased attention to power and questioning whom assessment is serving is central to expanding the discussion of what type of practice should be engaged by the assessment community. Assuming this frame when we design and conduct assessment work doesn't mean that we can't create or gather data or explore the possibilities afforded to us through large-scale data analysis. But it does require that we ask questions such as these. How do institutional assumptions and agendas, whether explicit or implicit, shape the student data we collect and further what type of data we deem valuable? Where does our accountability lie in the creation and use of student data and does it create harm? And are we engaging students in meaningful and authentic ways in the creation, analysis, and communication of data and insight? In her qualitative coding of library assessment conference proceedings, Doucette outlines that many assessment projects reported on appear to be motivated by proving and or improving something about the library. However, preceding even these broadly framed drivers, Doucette locates the antecedent motivation as coming from university administration who are themselves being pressured and required by governments and accrediting bodies to demonstrate learning and research outcomes. And she questions the extent to which we, the profession, respond without interrogation or reflection on the possibility of libraries playing a role in having conversations about or shaping that demand. In their 2018 article exploring the frictions that arise between learning analytics and some of the professional ethics of librarianship, Jones and Salo explore the motivations for using big data and learning analytics in libraries, pointing out that while institutions use data to better understand their students, in addition to other goals such as resource optimization, cost savings, and revenue increases, that examining student data may directly or only tangentially benefit students or may benefit only the institution. The potential imbalance between the benefits for involved parties doesn't seem to dissuade institutions from exploring and adopting learning analytics. 
And Wall, Hirsch, and Rogers would argue that it's this discourse of crisis around educational expenditures and outcomes that really drives this. In their consideration of higher education assessment as a tool of managerial and market-based accountability, Wall, Hirsch, and Rogers frame the broader motivation for assessment as creating symbolic academic capital, in addition to its uses for discovery, critical reflection, and ensuring student learning. They align assessment, as we've come to know and practice it, to serving a market rationale associated with creating workers and knowledge for economic development, rather than primarily serving more abstract educational purposes associated with developing human beings, advancing democracy, or creating a just world. For them, motivations for assessment, and I would extend data collection, are rooted in balancing bottom lines, mollifying public scrutiny, and satisfying government bodies and policymakers. Adherence to this view would, I expect, agree and feel justified that our accountability is directed toward the institutions which our libraries serve. And while we'll always have some accountability to our governing institutions, a critical assessment frame would have us consider whether we can, at the same time, demonstrate accountability to the populations of students we serve and what harm might be done if we cannot or do not demonstrate some responsibility to those from whom we gather the data. Writing from the context of research with Indigenous communities, but applicable, I would argue, to research involving many communities, Godry asserts that research is extractive. We mine the data of our subject for the purposes of answering our questions, fulfilling our motivations, and we communicate our results to a variety of stakeholders. It's a common refrain in the assessment community to close the feedback loop. But increasingly, from a critical assessment frame, I've been wondering exactly where we are closing it and in what manner. Are we sharing the results of our analysis in the same level of detail with administrators and students alike? In the discussions around what data to create and collect, are we as explicit in our decision-making and communication with the students from which we extract it as we are with our project partners across campus? Godry draws attention to the fact that often in Western research, responsibilities are oriented toward the academy, either toward academic colleagues or to what, towards some abstract notion of truth, while failing to account for many other versions of this truth. He compels researchers to recenter the communities under study in the research process, and better yet, to do research with and for communities, not on them. A requisite element of doing research with and for is the recognition of the agency and authority of community members. In her 2018 piece on prioritizing privacy in user research, one of the three principles Hinchliffe presents is user control. An individual may choose to share or not share data about themselves. This means pulling back the curtain on the systems that students interact with or pass through that retain user data and communicating in plain language with whom we will share this data and to what end. We must also then present opportunities for students to opt out of participation, which admittedly is difficult when we're talking about the many vendor platforms we utilize. If we are to collect student data, we should consider the extent to which we can incorporate our subjects as participants in the decision-making and meaning-making processes. To return for a moment to Godry, he points out the tendency of researchers to translate their findings into information that upholds colonial narratives and validates Indigenous experiences. This comparison is loaded, I know, uh, but in extracting and analyzing data of students without incorporating their voices, their knowledge of the experiences that create and contextualize that data, what are we missing, or worse yet, suggesting? As Jones and Sallow put it, the creation and collection of reams of data derived from new information flows and systems can result in digital dossiers that institutional actors can use to make consequential decisions about students that risk their autonomy. Institutions are purposefully aggregating massive amounts of student data without limiting data dredging for correlations that could favor values and interests of powerful actors while disenfranchising students. Some research has shown that there's potential for algorithms to reinscribe historical inequities simply because these inequities have historically existed and are accepted without an evaluation freed from the systemic forces that have entrenched the inequities in the first place. Like self-fulfilling prophecies in which the marginalized self has no say. 
So on that slightly depressing note, what do we do with all of it? Zoe already mentioned at the top some alternative methods to large scale collection of what is essentially transactional data. And here I'll bring in Wal Hirsch and Rogers again, who not only encourage consideration of different methods and types of data, but they propose an ethical and value-based practice, which makes transparent the purposes of the assessment process, surfacing both the apparent and underlying reasons that an assessment process has been initiated. They ask practitioners to explore credible methods to fit with ethical concerns and value com commitments associated with transparently identified purposes, identified stakeholder needs, and concerns over whose interests are served by different data gathering approaches. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nicole now to describe some of the methods that she's used, which I think hold a lot of potential in this regard. Great, thank you, Ebony. Um, Yes, so I'm going to jump in uh, to sort of what does this look like on the ground? How do we practically implement um, critical assessment practices in the profession or on our campuses? And I'll be sharing a research study that I conducted um, to develop learning outcomes for one of the frames of the framework for information literacy. Uh, sorry, I'm seeing if I have advance. There we go. Um, and to do this, I've, I've broken it down into four different components um, and as a way of thinking through applying critical assessment practices. The first is to adopt a theoretical stance. The second is to research or assess critical issues. The third is to align methodologies with the critical stance and then to apply the findings. Um, and I'll be walking through each of these four components for the research uh, project that I conducted. The first is adopting a, th a theoretical stance and specifically adopting a critical approach, a crit critical lens to the entire assessment or research process. And for me, this took the form of transformative research paradigms. And this was a paradigm that I discovered. Um, it was developed by a faculty member from Gallaudet University, Donna Mertens. And she describes transformative research paradigms as those that recommend the adoption of an explicit goal for research to serve the ends of creating a more just and democratic society. Uh, and I think in, particularly importantly, that it permeates the entire research process. Building on Merton's work, Sweetman, Beatty, and Creswell operationalized 10 characteristics of the transformative paradigm. Uh, and I won't go through all of these, but just a to highlight a few that can give you a sense of this paradigm. Things like uh, the authors open, openly declaring a theoretical lens, literature reviews, including discussions of diversity and oppression, um, outcomes benefiting the community and involvement of the per participants in research um, and uh, even potentially initiating the research. So with that sort of theoretical stance, um, I um, next uh, sought to research or assess um, a critical issue, um, particularly issues of power, social justice, critical consciousness, etc. And my area of interest was really a, what I saw as a problem or concern in the profession, particularly related to developing learning outcomes locally for the framework. Uh, there was also concern about whether or not the framework was even accessible. And critical, uh, those devoted to critical practice also questioned whether or not the framework really went far enough to address issues of social uh, justice. I also felt there was um, what I'm calling outcome dissatisfaction, which was just sort of a general dis dissatisfaction in the, pre in the profession with the outcomes that we have developed, processes for developing them, inspiration really uh, for outcomes that got more to what we were truly interested in. Um, and I was particularly interested in learning outcomes because they're really the foundation for all assessment. Um, and everything that we learn about student learning, um, everything that we examine flows forth from learning outcomes. At, oh, sorry. Uh, and that led to my question, how might we create local learning outcomes that are meaningful, important, um, and articulate social justice and critical thinking elements um, that I believe the framework um, really provides the opportunity for? Um, 
Next, I sought to align my methodology with my theoretical stance. Um, and I literally stumbled on a methodology called concept mapping. And those of you who are instruction librarians uh, may be very familiar with concept mapping that looks something like this. So mind mapping um, has been used extensively in, in information literacy pedagogy and in instruction. Um, and it's typically an individual activity where students engage in some kind of mind or concept mapping. Um, and it's a great methodology, but it's not the methodology um, that um, I'll be referring to. So the kind of concept mapping that I worked with is a distinct methodology, and it was developed by William Trochum, um, and he describes it as integrated mixed methods. So it includes both quantitative and qualitative components, um, but they work together. They're not distinct, um, they're not distinct parts. Um, and the focus of concept mapping is really the collaborative engagement of stakeholder knowledge, and it includes uh, four core components, and I'll walk through these in more detail, but uh, it includes brainstorming, sorting, rating, and then mapping. I felt concept mapping really aligned with a transformative paradigm for a number of reasons, uh, including it's, it's flexible enough to really allow the opportunity to focus on social just, justice and issues of power. I felt it had the potential to really deeply engage participants, um, almost as research partners. Um, and then it could address those uh, concerns within our community around developing learning outcomes. And I also thought by focusing on issues of social justice and learning outcomes, it might the outcome might really be used to affect change and to benefit the community, including our community of students. So my specific study, um, this was conducted in winter and fall of 2015, and I recruited 11 librarians from across the country. They represented a variety of different subject areas in terms of their responsibilities, uh, everything from humanities to STEM to business. Um, and it also include they represented a variety of different institution types, large, small, secular, non-secular, um, and um, also different student um, demographics. And the concept that we were exploring was just one of the frames, um, and that was the framework uh, or the frame information has value. Um, and I should note that the, the goal of this was not to create the learning outcomes that we should all use for this frame. It was to model a process and to test a process that we might implement locally. Um, and this study was conducted entirely virtually. And uh, to walk you through the steps of this process, um, the first component of concept mapping is being sure that the concept is clearly defined. In this case, it, it was clearly defined uh, by the process um, that created the framework. Um, and so we didn't have to do a lot of additional work to define the concept. Um, so the first time that the group got together was for a brainstorm focus group. Um, and this was a true brainstorm. Um, and uh, so our, our goal was to generate as many learning outcomes as possible for the frame. Um, and uh, we did not do any wordsmithing. Um, all ideas were, um, were valued and recorded. Um, so we didn't um, debate the merits of um, anything that was generated in the brainstorm focus group. Uh, this was conducted for 90 minutes via Zoom. And in the end, we had over 100 learning outcome statements. Statement synthesis, the next step um, is to sort of clean up what was generated in the focus group. So through this process, I did things like remove redundancies. I adjusted the language to make sure that it uh, was formatted in typical learning outcome statement format, um, as well as uh, making sure that the Bloom's taxonomy components um, matched with the sort of spirit of the uh, learning outcome. This was uh, provided to the group for optional feedback. Uh, and in the end, we had 75 uh, learning outcome statements. The next uh, 
component of concept mapping is sorting and rating. Through this process, each individual was received um, two things. Uh, one was um, all of the learning outcomes in a card sorting software so that they could sort them into groups. And the second was a Qualtrics survey with each learning outcome um, on a, with the option or the ability to rate it on a scale from one to 10 uh, based on how important uh, the individual felt that learning outcome was. And the uh, participants completed this in one week uh, after receiving the materials. The next step is map generation. So for, uh, and the, the thing with concept mapping is that it creates a literal visual map of how the group thinks about each of the, um, each of the things uh, from the brainstorm group um, in terms of the sorting um, and also the rating. So to generate the map, I applied hierarchical cluster analysis to a multi-dimensional scale. And both of those were created um, through the usability test um, card sorting software. I also named each cluster based on what the individuals had named their clusters and what I felt best captured sort of the, um, the overarching theme of that cluster. The group then met for a final reflection, and this was a process and feedback reflection as well as group analysis and reflection on the map that was generated. To give you a sense of what this looks like, we ended up with nine different clusters. You can see they're listed on the left. Um, and then I've also included just one uh, learning outcome to give you a sense of what the learning outcomes in that cluster looked like. And I won't go through all of them, but just to highlight a few that I believe capture the social justice, critical thinking elements we were interested in. Um, accessibility is power was one cluster. Example learning outcome, critique the concept of information neutrality. Um, information privilege included things like appraise their own and others information privilege and marginalization. Um, and then information is powerful, included things such as recognize that the, that the distribution of information can be politically motivated. Uh, and just a sidebar, this study was uh, conducted in 2015. I think it would be very interesting to replicate um, this now and see what new additional things come up. And this is the uh, concept map that was generated through this process. So you can see each of those numbered points represent one of the learning outcomes. Um, and the clustering, um, again, was created um, with the hierarchical cluster analysis. A couple things to note, the darker the saturation, the darker the blue on the map, um, the, the more highly rated that in that cluster on average was for the group. Um, you'll also notice that some of the clusters are more tightly packed um, and some are, are sort of misshapen and more spread out. The more tightly packed the cluster, the more uh, consensus there was among individuals that those learning outcomes belong together. The more spread out, um, the, more, the less consensus. So that was the um, process, and I, I really felt like it was a highly successful process. It was very engaging. Um, the outcome really highlighted the issues of social justice, of critical thinking, of the common good that we, we started out with. Um, and then um, where I'm at now um, is applying the findings. Um, so how might we use these findings to address issues of power, social justice, and the common good? And I'm not, uh, as deeply into this part, um, uh, and also just for time considerations, but a few things that I've been experimenting with um, that I feel also align with transformative and other critical um, methods is coding student work. Um, and I've also um, conducted, in conjunction with faculty members, document-based interviews with students. Um, and I believe the learning outcomes um, uh, generated during this process could be valuable in terms of these kinds of uh, methodologies for assessment. I'm also very interested in other approaches. Um, so that's the um, transformative mixed methods and concept mapping. And just a super quick plug, I do have an article that will be out this summer in communications and information literacy. So you can look out for that. And now I will hand it back over to Nicole, um, who's going to moderate the Q&A. 
Thanks so much, everyone. That was really enlightening and um, learned a lot through that. I've posted some tweets on Twitter of my notes. Um, I saw a couple other people were tweeting as well, so feel free to check over there. Um, okay, so let's get to the questions. Um, Matt's been posting them. We have a shared doc here, so I'm just gonna open this up. Um, I think I'll just go in order and um, let the panelists respond and then we'll move on to the next one. And if you have um, questions as we go, keep adding them to the chat and Matt will send them over to us and we'll just keep going until we run out of time. Um, so the first question we have um, is actually a comment from Ann Zald. Um, she said, thank you, Zoe, for this great overview. I don't think the extremes that you highlighted are mutually exclusive. Indeed, your source list at the end of your talk emphasized this as qualitative and student learning focused research slash publication continues to occur. So that's more of a comment, but um, Zoe, um, if you'd like to respond, please go ahead. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, great. Um, okay, so next question is from Brian Hickam. Uh, please let us know how often data on students is broken down by size and type of school, location of school, e.g. country, region, U.S., Midwest, versus U.S., West Coast, et cetera. I'd like to know how easy it is to compare apples to apples for each type of situation. I have the same face as Nicole and Ebony. Maybe I'm not exactly sure the context of the question. Nicole Gowski, do you can you maybe interpret that a little bit for us? What you think they're asking for? Or um, yeah, let me let me look at this again. Um, so I guess just um, when looking at student data, how is it broken down by the type of school or location of school, and then. Um, I guess he's asking uh, for maybe if, if you'd like to add more to the comments, uh, Matt can send that over to us too if you want to, um, Brian, if you want to add more detail. But um, it looks like if not using uh, peer institutions, how do you compare if they're different or in different regions, et cetera? That's, that's my guess. I guess the first thing that comes to mind for me just from what I shared is, um, you know, assessment and action has a searchable database of all the hundreds of projects that were in it and so you can look for peer institutions that way pretty easily if you want to find someone in your region or a similar kind of university or community college and I think there's a really good cross-section of types of institutions represented across those cohorts so that's one resource that comes to mind for me I don't know if Ebony or Nicole have other ideas about how to respond to that From the Canadian context, I'm not even going to wade into that. Okay, uh, we can go on to the next question then. Um, from Ali Sullivan, this is for Nicole. When creating the learning outcomes, did you use the traditional students will be able to idea? Yes, so the prompt um, for the brainstorm was students will be able to, and then we just brainstormed um, from there. Um, but that being said, we did not spend time making sure that every uh, brainstorm statement fit with that perfectly. Um, and I think one of the powerful things about it was that our thoughts weren't interrupted by some of the honestly nitpicking that I think you can get into when you're making, when you're developing uh, learning outcomes. And not that that shouldn't happen later, but in terms of getting thinking flowing, it was helpful not to focus too much on that. Okay, um, from Chriselle Rodriguez, this is also for Nicole. Um, I see we have two more um, also for Nicole after this one, just FYI. Um, are the strategic planning outcomes of the university taken into consideration when creating the library learning outcome? In this project, no, um, especially everyone was from different institutions. So um, it wasn't, that wasn't the focus. I do think that this methodology could be used 
to do that. Um, I think you could integrate that as part or even make it a focus of a brainstorm um, around learning outcomes. Um, it's a pretty flexible methodology. Okay, uh, and next question is from Megan Kinney, also for Nicole. What software did you use for the cluster analysis? For the cluster analysis, um, the usability test, which was the card sorting software, created a um, multi-dimensional scale and also provided the hierarchical cluster analysis. Um, so I took the multi-dimensional scale and then just applied it literally by hand um, to the um, multi-dimensional scale. Um, I did try to produce it in um, SPSS and it didn't work and the usability test was uh, easier and better. Um, there is a proprietary software that will do concept mapping for you, but it's a little bit expensive. So I also wanted to see if this could be done in a, in a more cost efficient way. Okay, and um, one more for Nicole from Ansald. How did you reconcile the individual clustering work to create a single clustering slash mapping? Um, so the hierarchical cluster analysis guides you with that. Um, so um, hierarchical cluster analysis is kind of like a tree, so you can pick um, like how, how deep in the ring you want to go for each cluster. Um, so it actually, it made it quite easy just to look at that and to decide um, uh, like what level of, um, of uh, cluster you wanted to go for. But it basically guides you for what the boundaries of the cluster should be. Okay, um, next question is from Stephanie, Stephanie Alexander, and then there's a follow up. Um, so the question is, are there best practices or suggestions for how to include students in the library assessment process? And then there's a follow up from Laura Wimberly, where she says, that's a good question. I'm also especially interested in how you encourage student participation in this kind of research, especially students who don't use the library regularly. I'll jump in on this one. Um, so I, I don't have like a nice little rule book to tell people this. Uh, there are some great examples out there. I think a lot of it comes down to the institutional context and your relationships with students. Uh, relationship building is extremely important in this sense. Um, from a methodological perspective, uh, participatory design is one approach that's used frequently to bring students in more fully to the assessment process. However, even with that, if you're not willing to give them kind of true agency and power in the situation, you kind of take the teeth out of that method. Um, in terms of engaging students who don't use the library regularly, it's a challenge we all have. Um, I'm currently working with someone here to develop a quick survey that we're just going to take on an iPad around campus to get um, to people that don't use the library, but again, this is where relationships um, come in, uh, factor in heavily. I would say in terms of examples of work that's been done really well involving students, um, at the library assessment conference in 2018, four months ago, uh, there was a presentation on participatory design by Scott Young from Montana State University um, based on a, a project he did with um, Selena Brown Otter on um, involving indigenous students, Native American students in a participatory design process. And Haley Fargo also presented on that paper on, um, I believe it was first generation students at Penn State. So I would definitely check out that, um, that presentation, those studies as really great examples of um, engaging user communities and sharing power and agency um, in the assessment process. I agree with all of that. Um, I also would um, share, so the document-based um, interviews that I mentioned, um, those have been really interesting in terms of the level of engagement and of students in that process. They've, um, doing them, I've realized students aren't often asked to talk about their work in that way and that it was really a, a engaging process for them. Um, so I think there's also, other methodologies that um, 
that can just engage students in a more authentic way in talking about their work or talking about their learning um, and, and things like that, I think, have a lot of um, promise as well. Okay. Um, next question is from Tyler Moses. Uh, where can we learn more about pedagogies associated with assessing student learning? Um, I'm just thinking about that question um, in terms of pedagogies. I'm not sure if, if the question is pedagogies um, for assessment or just different assessment practices uh, related to student learning. I guess I'm, I'm a little unclear on the question. Um. Maybe, um, I, hopefully this is a correct interpretation, but I would guess just um, maybe methodologies associated with assessing student learning. Um, yeah, because that wouldn't quite be a pedagogy or how does a um, critical assessment fit into uh, the pedagogies or approaches you have discussed. Maybe that helps. I would say in terms of how it fits into my pedagogy, um, for me, issues of social justice, um, equality, sort of the, the uh, more critical components of information literacy are of deep interest to me. Um, so um, I'm interested in examining those in my pedagogy. Um, and then the limited amount of um, assessment of student work that I've done with the learning outcomes um, from the research study, um, I, I found it very helpful to be able to look at student work and sort of identify what those more critical information literacy skills looked like in terms of their work and to identify areas where um, we could perhaps better support their learning in those areas. So um, that definitely informed um, how I moved forward um, in particular classes um, and how I designed um, my, my, my lessons for the course. Um, um, so I was able to shift and develop my own pedagogy based on what I was observing through student work. And I think having those kinds of learning outcomes allowed me to um, investigate that. I guess I would add that um, it's interesting. I think all the literature I mentioned is within LIS scholarship, but obviously there's a lot to be learned about pedagogy and student learning assessment outside of LIS. Um, I think a field that a lot of librarians pay close attention to, of course, is English composition because we work so closely with those instructors with that discipline. Um, so looking at the world of rhetoric and composition and how student learning assessment is discussed and that discipline I think is interesting. Um, I was also going to say that one of the um, readings that I recommended is by Karen Diller, um, who was actually the faculty that taught my assessment class in grad school. Um, and I like Karen's article because it's about um, student portfolios and collecting multiple samples of student work over time within a program um, and working with those program faculty to evaluate student work. Um, and I think that she had a big impact on my philosophy of teaching and assessing information literacy and that, um, that, it's, that it's helpful in some ways, but not true student learning assessment to ask a student at the end of the one shot if it was useful. You know, yes or no, was this useful to you is not true student learning assessment of information literacy. And that's um, informed a lot of my approach to teaching and assessing information literacy. Okay, looks like we have one, two, three, four, five questions left. So hopefully maybe we can try and fit them in, <laughs> in the last five minutes. Um, so we have uh, Kate Zollner, uh, this question's for Ebony. Can you share examples of libraries that have done good work sharing assessment results with students? Um, I can make this quick. I don't have great examples off the top of my head, but I think with this question, I would reframe it to say it's not just about the sharing of results. I know I did focus on uh, communicating results, but I, I think, again, involving students from the outset in the process uh, makes it easier to have um, 
conversations with them about the results and conversations that might um, more accurately reflect the conversations that we have um, with administrators or colleagues as we're working on our decision making around assessment. Okay, and uh, Sarah maybe <laughs> asks, I'm wondering why learning outcomes based assessment and the framework does or did not include student input and experience. Rather, we as experts describe our ideal student in our learning outcomes, but what about addressing what students value and want to learn? I think that's a good question. Um, and <laughs> I was on ACRL IS during framework discussions and I'm trying to remember if or how student voice was brought into it. I don't think it was, um, but I think it could be. Um, and I actually think it would be fascinating to do something like concept mapping with students and with faculty. Um, and some iterations of concept mapping actually do work with different distinct stakeholder groups and then look at um, what are the consistencies or differences between how those two groups uh, conceive of uh, that particular concept. So I think it's an area that there could be a lot of really interesting, exciting work around. Um, and not just that methodology, I think there's other ways that we could get at it. Um, but um, I think it would be really interesting and um, I think that's a great question. Okay, we have um, two questions that are aimed at Nicole. So from Brooke Duffy, I'm gonna combine them into one. Um, how does Nicole's methodology integrate student participation and does Nicole Branch have a paper with detailed methodology explaining the cluster mapping method? Uh, my particular study did not um, integrate students um, in the development of the learning outcomes, um, but I, I do think that that would be a really interesting um, sort of next level um, or next step. Um, in terms of um, applying the learning outcomes, um, as I mentioned, I think the document based interviews have been a really interesting opportunity to connect with students. Um, but I think there's more that could be done um, in terms of using those learning outcomes with students. Um, in terms of the paper, we do actually um, on our slides, uh, we have a extensive uh, list of, of references. Um, so you can check those for articles about concept mapping. Um, and um, the, Trochum is the is the main um, author, but uh, and gives very very concise explanations of the methodology. Okay, we're doing so good. We have three minutes left, and we have one more question. <laughs> so um, from Scott Young, when we're aiming at the difficult task of changing culture, who are our allies? Who should we be working with across campus and in our wider communities? Um, I will say our, our allies are whoever will listen and we should be working with whoever we can. Um, I'm fortunate in that um, administration at certain levels in my institution are receptive to this kind of thing or this at least this kind of questioning that I'm bringing up around assessment activities. Um, and in terms of who I'm working with, I think um, again, I'll go back to relationships, working with faculty who have the connections with students and engaging both faculty and students to get their perspective on the work that I'm doing and to ensure that their voices are represented. Um, yeah, I guess that would be my short answer. Okay, oh, sorry, go ahead, Zoe. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, I think sometimes student services gets overlooked and that librarians do work a lot with faculty and sometimes we're part of faculty shared governance and I think it's easy to lose sight of all the different wraparound services that students use and looking at the ways that um, they gather data on students, the kinds of questions they ask, the way that they answer them um, can be interesting and informative. It can also give you some insight into how much data is extracted from students from all different service points. You know, they're swiping into gyms, they're swiping into different centers and um, it, I think just the library should be involved in more of those campus-wide conversations about how are we tracking students and how do we get data from them and how are they ethically involved in that. Yeah, and actually I would just add to that too, institutional research, um, which might have different names. It might be institutional planning at different institutions. They are 
uh, typically the kind of holders of a lot of student data. So engaging them in conversations around this. And I think I would add to my previous response as well, even if you don't, if you haven't yet identified allies or you're uncertain about how administration might respond, um, a lot of what I've been exploring is just how to frame questions to people when they are designing projects or um, engaging in assessment, questions that will make them stop and consider power structures or positionality um, or kind of what's at stake for different groups that are involved. So even if you don't feel like you can kind of blaze out of the gates with some of this at your institution, um, I think there's always room to question. Okay, great. I see we had one more question, but unfortunately we're out of time and it's about the legal and ethical issues in collecting this type of data. And I feel like that would definitely take more than 10 seconds to answer. So um, <laughs> feel free to email the panelists um, with that question or any other questions you all have. Um, follow them on Twitter. Um, and I want to thank all of our panelists so much today. This was wonderful. Um, thanks to Elois, uh, Elois for uh, managing the technical aspects of the uh, webinar. And also thanks to Matt for managing um, all of the Q&A and behind the scenes. So um, great. Thanks everyone for attending. And there will be a recording. Uh, it should be emailed to you um, sometime later this week, hopefully. So thanks again. Bye. Thanks.